Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tompkins Square Library. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. My name is Corinne Neary. I'm the library manager here. It's great to see you all here tonight uh, for a program about books and about reading. It's wonderful. And actually, a lot of new faces I haven't seen before, which is also wonderful. So please, uh, if you're ever in the branch, say hello. I love to meet new people. It makes my life a lot more fun when I know the people at the library. Uh, so I always like to ask, who here has a library card? Oh, wow. All right, we're almost at 100%, which is awesome. I was going to say, get a library card. But in this room, I don't need to say that. Uh, so I'm guessing, since you're all library users, you've heard a little bit about the budget cuts that the library is facing this year. And it's not too late to still sign a letter. We have them upstairs. We were hoping, actually, we might come to an agreement today. Uh, but I don't think it's happened yet, as of right now. Uh, and I do want to mention something very important. Um, you might have seen the letter in the press Sarah Jessica Parker wrote uh, about libraries and about how much she loves the library and how important they are to New Yorkers. It got a lot of attention. It was picked up by a lot of media, and it actually made a big impact. And I just want you to think about that tonight, that she's done a lot for us in this fight for funding. And we really are very appreciative of that. Uh, so we're very, very happy to have you all here tonight. Um, in partnership with the National Book Foundation and the New York Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, this is the second year of this series. Uh, you can find the recordings online of last year's conversations with Tim Gunn, Thelma Golden, and Jesus Nice. Uh, they're on the NYPL and NBF websites, the National Book Foundation websites. And tonight is the second event in this year's series of three conversations uh, with New Yorkers. Uh, Brian Lair, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Sonia Manzano talking about the books that they love the most. Uh, hopefully, I think everyone got a copy on the way in of The Old Drift, right? Uh, we're having a book club discussion about that title here uh, Wednesday, July 31st. So please come back and continue the conversation. Start reading or reread it, read it if you've read it already. I haven't started, and I'm very excited to get going on that book. I'll be there that night. Um, and now... Uh, I just want to welcome Beth Harrison, the Deputy Director of the National Book Foundation. Uh, so please give her a big round of applause and enjoy the night. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Corinne, and thanks for the warm welcome here. And what a great looking crowd. This is exciting. Um, we're recording, but I'm still going to tell you this is kind of like my favorite series that we do. We so often present writers talking about their writing, which is the best. But to hear about people who just love books like we all do and to hear people talk about reading and what got them excited about it just gets me excited every single time that I do this. So I'm excited, as you can see. Um, I want to thank um, everyone at the Tompkins Square branch for hosting us tonight. We're delighted to have Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker here in conversation with Fatima Farheen Mirza. We're gonna talk about the way that the books have shaped lives. Before we begin, I wanna tell you just a tiny little bit about the National Book Foundation and what we do. Our mission is to celebrate the best in American literature, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. We do that uh, through the National Book Awards, which have been around since 1950, and they've celebrated great honorees such as William Carlos Williams, Ralph Ellison, Rachel Carson, Adrian Rich, Lydia Davis, ta Coates, and so many more. Our work also includes a wide variety of edu educational programs and public programs in addition to the awards. Uh, we have a program called Book Rich Environments, which by the end of this summer will have distributed, over the past three years, one million free books to children and families living in public housing across the country, and we're super proud of that, and that's happening. Yeah. Um, 40 different communities across America, including um, every borough in New York City. Um, there's about 70,000 books, 75,000 books that are like um, getting into the hands of kids right now, and um, I just got goosebumps. Um, <laughs> I love our programs. Um, we also have uh, programs that bring National Book Award honored authors uh, to community colleges, public libraries, performance venues, all kinds of great spots around the country, rural areas, urban areas, suburban areas. We do it all, we do it everywhere. We're in about 35 states as of the end of this summer. And just a few years ago, we were in maybe seven states. So we've really grown, we're trying to be national, but New York is home. So the New York Public Library is our um, 
fabulous partner, and I can't thank them enough. Again, we're thanking the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their generous support. They're the ones who enabled you to all have a free book tonight, so enjoy that, and thank your Department of Cultural Affairs. Okay, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, Sarah, Jessica, and Fatima will have a conversation tonight for about 40 minutes, and then we're going to have some time for question and answer from the audience. So get your great questions ready. Um, when you have a question, uh, raise your hand. There will be a staff person who will come swiftly over to you with a microphone. As I mentioned, we are recording, so we do want to get um, not just their comments and conversation, but your comments and conversation and questions um, on record. So wait for the microphone, and um, you'll get to feel you know, the nervousness that we're <laughs> All feeling here when you have a microphone in front of you. Um, uh, after the program, I hope you'll stick around. We're going to have a uh, continued conversation and some refreshments. Okay, now here we go. Uh, the main event, uh, introductions. Our moderator, again, is Fatima Farheen Mirza. She was born and raised in California. She's a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop and a recipient of the Missioner Copernic um, Copernicus Fellowship. Her debut novel, A Place for Us, was the first title published by Sarah Jessica Parker's imprint, SJP for Ho Hogarth. The book was an instant New York Times bestseller. It was named the best book of 2018 by the Washington Post, NPR, People, BuzzFeed, and others. She's also a teaching artist with the National Book Foundation. We have a program called Book Up, and it's essentially a book club for middle school students, and um, she is a delight and beloved by all the kids that she works with every year. And finally, our special guest tonight, Sarah Jessica Parker. She's the editorial director of SJP for Hogarth. She is the star and executive producer of Divorce, which premiered in October 2016 on HBO. She currently serves as vice chairman of the board of directors of the New York City Ballet. In November 2009, the Obama administration elected her to be a member of the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities. She lives with her husband, three children, and lots of books right here in New York City. Please welcome Sarah Jessica and Fatima. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you um, to the National Book Foundation and to the New York Public Library for putting on this event and Sarah Jessica uh, for doing it. Um, I know firsthand what a privilege it is to be read by someone like Sarah Jessica. Um, it was a, you know, when I met her and we started speaking about books and about my book, it was, it was so inspiring. Um, to hear the way that she thinks about literature and the way that she talks about it. And so I know that we're all in for a treat tonight. Um, and today actually also, um, and maybe I'm the only one who thinks of it like this, but it marks the one year anniversary, yeah, of when my book came out. And we, th on this day last year, we were doing an event together at um, Union Square. And I was so, so nervous. And tonight I'm a little bit less nervous. <laughs> Um, and also tonight, by tonight, the imprint has grown and it has three books, Dawn being the most recent one. Um, and before we talk about that, I want to begin at the very beginning of your relationship to reading. And I want to ask, you know, what, what fostered this lifelong relationship that you have? Um. Good evening. <laughs> I'm comforted by your presence. Um, and I celebrate the extraordinary success of your book. And um, it's very nice to be together on its year anniversary. Um, so I don't know, perhaps like many of you in the room or some of you in the room, I, I, had, a, I had a mother who was a reader. Um, I had a mother who was a, perhaps a little bit of a lonely, a lonely young woman, didn't have a huge amount of friends, but but books were a great companion to my to my mother, and um, and I think um, the library, in in particular, served um, a very important role in my mother's life. And it was um, like it was through her relationship with librarians and cultivating, um, you know, sort of um, 
a, f a sort of a family, frankly, at, at, at her local public library in Cincinnati, Ohio. She was introduced to The New Yorker when she was 13. The librarians would save it for her. Um, she would read the New York Times at the public library. And she, she lived to be inside the pages of a book. And I think probably for the same reasons that I love being inside the, you know, between the covers, inside the pages, is just to be taken somewhere else. And, um, and as I have traveled a lot of my life and worked and been alone and um, needed something that felt steady, it was always a book. And um, so my mother had a rule had a rule growing up in our home, and which was you could never leave, you were not only allowed to leave the house without a book in your hand, but this was imposed upon even those of us who who could who had yet learned how to read. <laughs> but she didn't. She said it didn't matter. It was a sort of it was osmosis. It was sort of this relationship that she was she was creating for us and even when we would go to museums and we were very young and she would drag us to museums and she would say if you get bored it doesn't matter because you'll have a book and if you can't read it doesn't matter because you'll look at the pages of the book or you'll look around the room and you'll have your book or she'll make us go to the symphony <laughs> and which was really it seemed boring but if you had a book you know so she um yeah, she created this relationship of necessity, and then we became young adults, and we chose all on our very own to never leave house, you know, never leave the house without a book. Um, so it's my mother. It's my mother, a greedy reader, and now I am too. <laughs> I, I love that, and I love the way that you described her as somebody who would live inside the books, because mm -hmm. um, it's one of when I first heard you speaking about books, one of the thoughts that struck me was that, you know, Sarah Jessica reads as though she's lived inside them. That was an actual thought. And so it's amazing to think that, you know, your parents can really teach you how to, how to, how to read. Do you remember some of those early books that made you l th realize that this is magical? You just want to stay up all night? It's funny. I don't, I feel like I've been asked this question so often and I, meaning it's because it's a Good question. I'm always curious about what were those early books, especially for, for for people. I'm so curious about other people who have such this who have a sort of crazy obsessive relationship with books, with reading. You know, and I can't. I should have. I, I always. I think often I should just lie. I, I mean, I honestly feel like I should just make up some book titles. But I think honestly, what happened is I think. I think we read so much, honestly, and we spent so much time reading. We didn't have a television, by the way. We were only allowed Amazing. to listen to NPR, a local NPR station. Um, so we spent so much time reading that I don't think I recall titles. And I recall learning to read. I recall the, the exercise and how hard it seemed, how how far away the destination was, I was like, well, this can possibly ever happen. Like, how will they ever be able to string all these letters together? Um, but I remember later as a young adult, when I started, not a very, very young adult, um, reading, I think really the first book that really took me away was The Mixed Up Files of Miss Basilie Frank Weiler. And it was before I moved to New York, everybody, most people know this book. And um, I, I think it's a really good example of being transported. And that girl was looking for the same thing. And I think it's so perfectly written. And I tried to <laughs> tried to make my daughters <laughs> read it, but they were really, really young. And um, like together at night. But they were about six or seven. And they finally said to me, we just, we don't know what you're talking about. Like we don't. <laughs> Like, what, what, why is she miserable? Like, what, you know, what do you mean a balance sheet? Like, there was talk of, like, a checkbook, like, you know. Um, but I remember that book specifically because of its, its, its escapism. It's like a story of, uh, it's a fantasy. And um, there's so many perfect details for young readers, you know, grabbing pennies from the fountain in front and putting your feet up on the toilet stalls and what that picture meant and who painted it and the statue and the, like, so that was the first book I remember reading that I picked that I was like, oh, this is where I want to be, you know? And it also sounds like you've tried to instill the love of learning in your children too then, the way that your mother had with you. Have you been successful in that? Has that <laughs> been? <laughs> I think I, I yes, I, um, I mean, 
I, I guess I, I'm happy to share that my children are readers. Like it's it's such a thrill, and I wasn't certain. I wasn't certain how, um, you know, how how true it was. I wasn't entirely convinced that it was like a longing and a yearning the way I felt. But this morning, my daughter came down the stairs, and um, she was the last one up and out. And she walked into the kitchen, and she walked. Um, I have twin daughters who are will be ten in in, a, in ten days, and they are very different readers. They have completely different tastes. It's so it's so interesting to watch them select and start like creating their own way into books. And then I have a son who's almost seventeen, and he's a great reader, although less for pleasure now because school has consumed all of his reading time. But yeah, they're 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 good and excited, and um. They're hungry readers. It's, re it's really nice. I'm, I'm enormously relieved. That's amazing. And I, I love, you know, I have three younger brothers, and some of them are not readers, and one of them is. And it also makes it so fun to be able to talk about that with them. It, yeah. like, adds a whole new layer to your relationship. With so I'm curious um, about you <laughs> reading. <laughs> because I am, I'm wondering, because, you know, obviously you're such, such a gifted writer, but who who was the reader or who wasn't the, or how how was yours how did your relationship with books start and words and yeah, i don't never mind the writing part yeah. but just i don't think i've ever told you this story um but for me my both of my parents they were never readers growing up but when i was very young my dad would buy uh books and they had they were books about like bears that were brothers and sisters or just like you know children's books right. and instead of instead of reading to me my dad would ask me if i could read to him and i didn't really know how to read yet but those are some of my earliest memories is trying to wow. like, to read to him and um why do you think what why do you think he was asking you to read to him? I have you know I honestly don't know maybe maybe because he didn't have a relationship to reading. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that he's only recently begun actually right. and it's been such it's been one of the like it's been I'm so proud of him because my whole life he never read and then I wrote this novel. Um and then I wrote this novel, and then I gave it to my parents, thinking, well, you know, I've never seen them read, so they're, he's probably not going to read it. And then my dad was reading it, and he would call me and be like, Fatma, I just want to know what happens next. And I would say, Baba, that's nothing I did. That's just the experience of reading. <laughs> and then since then, he's, he's made a commitment that he's going to read one book a month. Wow. And he's kept great. it. And he shifted so quickly into becoming a critic. <laughs> yeah. He'll call me now and he'll be like, Fatma, the way that that author ended the book, I just wasn't, I wasn't on board. And I'm like, Baba, what are you talking about? Um, so yeah, that's, that was really my introduction to reading. Yeah. Um, um, one thing I wanted to ask you, you know, you, you juggle so many different roles and you are um, so busy and, um, and I'm sure so many people would want to hear, how do you find time to read? Is that something that you have to actually, um, is, that a, is that like a decision that you have to make? Like I'm going to set time aside because even, even for me, I love reading and yet I resist it every day. I never want to do it and then I'm always happy I've done it. Yeah. It's like working out. Do you feel that way? I, I don't feel that. I mean, I don't resist it. I have to resist making time to read when there is none, like yeah. cheating on what is, you know, what other responsibilities exist. I think um, because I think because I, ha I have a job that actually creates the time and space because um, when you're shooting and you're sitting in hair and makeup, if you know your lines, assuming you know your lines, it's a really great time to read, or a long drive to a set is a really great time to read if you know your lines, <laughs> and you should know your lines. So I am all, so the set is, I get a huge amount of reading done, and purposefully on the set, 
which some people have ob objected to. Um, I always have a book, when they call cut, or they're changing the lens, I always know that within arm's length, there's a book. Or if I'm my character is carrying a bag, my own personal book is in the bag. Or if it's I'm lying in bed, then I know I can put it under the pillow next to me in the bed. And um, some actors feel like it's antisocial that I'm that I'm antisocial, but in actuality, it's it's my way of staying focused, which t doesn't really make sense because it takes me away from the scene I'm shooting. But actually, it keeps me really focused because there's so much chatter when they call cut or they're changing the lens or moving the camera or you have 20 minutes because they're changing the light. You know, they're big changes and small. It For me, it just keeps me really focused and it keeps me calm. It, the stress that or the things that I'm concerned about, the, I don't know, it's really helpful. So I'll tell you one really, really quick little anecdote. <laughs> I don't have a lot of anecdotes, but... I do have this one, and it's real. It's true. Um, when I was shooting a movie called Hocus Pocus, and it took months and months and months to shoot, and I was um, wearing period costumes, so I had a proper corset on, um, I think from the 1600s, right? Would be, yes. And um, I figured out that I could fold the New York Times three ways, like, like they used to do on the subway. Do you remember when people used to read on the subway? Don't you guys miss that so much? Um, anyway, I would fold my 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 times like that, and because we spent so much time flying in that movie, we were we were um, you know we were elevated up in in um, harnesses, and we'd be way up on a soundstage flying, and I would just tell them, no, you don't have to bring me down between shots, and I would just pull the times out of and the New Yorker too. I could pull it out of my from back from behind my corset or under my skirt, and then just sit in my harness. 50 feet up in a soundstage at Disney and um, read the Times. That is a committed <laughs> reader. Because the book was too bulky. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> and I, I was actually wondering about, you know, the relationship between your life as a reader and your life as an actor. And if, if you think that maybe your love of reading has at all informed the way that you approach your role when you're embodying a character. Does it, do you think it's helped you imagine characters or...? I think it's made me want to play better, <laughs> more interesting characters. I mean, I think books, there's so, so, so many great books, and there's so many interesting stories, and there's so many characters that are unfamiliar to us, if that's what you reach for, and I know you and I both reach for the unfamiliar, that it makes me, it, it makes me want more from my own industry. It makes me want those stories for everybody, not just women, for everybody. Um, so I think it informs me, but not in a way that is necessarily a direct action. I think it inspires, um, you know, it, there's, it, it inspires uh, sort of um, an envy in, in some ways, but also that we could be, we could and continue to, we could and should continue to tell more interesting and diverse stories, you know. Um, I, I think it's almost like there's a demand for it now. Um, so I just wish I was <laughs> doing them, you know. I, I love that. And um, But do you think the opposite could be true? Are you ever reading a novel? And then because you spend so much time also imagining how characters occupy space in a scene, do you, or do you like, find yourself imagining possibly, like, facial expressions? I don't know what it's like to be an actor, but <laughs> do you imagine, like, facial expressions of the characters in a moment that you think other readers might not be doing? Or? I bet I'm imagining just the same way mm -hmm. anybody else in this room. I'm, I feel like my back is to most, I'm sorry. Um, to, probably the same way. I think, you know, great storytelling and great writing um, doesn't, doesn't need for you to create. It's this bizarre and wonderful um, miracle where it, you know, you don't have to work hard to create what what the writer is sharing with you, whether it's color or disposition or the smell of a place or the sight of seeing somebody that they didn't recognize, you know, all that. 
I think that's what astounds me most about good writing is how deeply you are exactly where the author wants you to be. And it's extraordinary. And it's a sort of skill that I just, I, 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 I guess more than anything, I just have such admiration for being able to take people right where you needed them to be and right where the characters need the reader to be. Um, like I, I think sometimes, I remember talking to Molly Stern, um, who um, was a publisher at Crown and, and Hogarth and um, sort of you know, brought us together. And I remember telling her about a story and I was like, and I can't believe how right he got it, you know. It's like, that's Copenhagen or you know, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, have you been to Copenhagen? I was like, no, I've never been to Copenhagen. She's like, what do you, but, but, but a good writer makes you think like, Absolute, that's exactly what a pastry smells like at 4 a.m. on the streets, you know, in the Netherlands. I don't know. Um, um, I think about that when I'm teaching writing. I always tell my, my, my writers that you should write the scene as though you're, you're holding the reader's hand and, like, you're leading them to everything that they need to see. And if they've gone too, long, too many pages out of smell, then that's, like, a completely... That's, like, a whole way of being in the world that you haven't yeah. activated. And if yeah. you've gone too long without a sound, then that, too. You do that so... Have you all read A Place for Us? Have you had the privilege? <laughs> yes. yes. If you've not, I'm... I, I Really, I... Like, any skin in the game, I'm removing. It's because... There is so much of that detail that you do so beautifully. It's it's bizarre at your ten, tender years that you are able to um, that you have the language at your fingertips in that way because it's so much of, of your book is the sight and the smell. It's the culture. It's you know all of that that is necessary, right? Because we need to know who that family is in order to understand why all those images are so important and heartbreaking, why they create such sentimentality and also such frustration. But without the descriptive part of your book, we couldn't as much, we couldn't be, we couldn't care, we couldn't worry in the same way. It's the details that, that, that capture readers, I think. Thank you. Do you guys see how lucky I've been to have Sarah Jessica yeah. as the editorial director mm -hmm. of, of the imprint? Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I just am so fortunate that it found your hands. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm wondering, you know, what has, has your reading, has your relationship to reading changed as the editorial director? Has it changed the way that you read books? I know for myself, I loved reading so much as a kid, and then when I decided to become a writer, all of a sudden the joy from it was, was right. gone, and it just became very pleasurable homework. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and I wonder, do you feel that way? I don't, because I don't have the same, ex I don't have the same experience with the written word that you do. You, you, ha you produce, you have to, or I'm going to say you want to produce. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read, so Strangely, it hasn't it hasn't changed radically the ex my my experience reading. I, I think I, I try to be more thoughtful about um, you know as an as, like I'm not a line editor. I'm sort of a, a more general you know thinking generally about story and plot and character and you know audience. Um, but but I always feel even when a book you know wasn't for me or we didn't get it or even if it just simply wasn't ready, I never, I, I never want my time back. Um, I, I still like I'm not any more like I'm not more cynical now because I have the chance to put a book in the hands of a reader. No, I love it as much. In fact, I think the thing is, um, it's maybe slightly a little bit. You know, like mm, I can call and maybe get an early copy. Like that's what it's made me a little bit, um, you know, naughty. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. And I know that the third um, book, Dawn, is one of the the titles. And there's uh, there are uh, four other titles that you've chosen. Is there any ones that you want to talk about? Like what drew you to them? Well, do you guys have, have you read have you read I, I'm have you read some of these, most, most of these, the ones that we have on this list. I'm just curious. I don't, I don't want to talk too much about books that a majority of you haven't read because there's nothing like experiencing a book for the first time without someone basically ruining it for you. I mean, I loved all these books 
Um, the old drift, I see it in a lot of people's hands. Are people done with it? Midway? Show of hands. How? You just got it. Oh, we shouldn't talk about this book. <laughs> this, well, we, let's start with that. All right. S have you read it yet? No. Okay. No, it's a huge undertaking. Yeah. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. It reminds me so much of the way I felt when I read your book because it is epic. If, if you, so you've not read it, most, nobody in here yet has read it? You're in for such a treat. Okay, you're in for such a treat. And, and um, I, I was talking to somebody who had, who, who had it and it's, um, be patient with it because it, it, it travels, it's sweeping, it's, it, it's a really like a, a massive examination of time and place and there's much that I didn't know, much that I, not only did I learn, but I had to learn. It was important that I understood better. Um, but be, be patient with it. If you're, if you're a racer reader, um, you might find that you're not racing, but don't, don't stop because it, it, it all adds up. It's an accumulation, it's an extraordinary accumulation um, of experience and, and, um, and place and, um, you know, deeply upsetting about the way people behaved and the way people do behave and, um, and courage and um, fantasy. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I could not put it down. And it's, you know, been met with all sorts of ravishing praise, and it's, in my humble opinion, very deserving. I love what you were saying about, like, it taught you things that you couldn't know otherwise. To me, like, learning, you think that you're reading just to get an experience, but it also teaches you so much, whether it is about whatever the character is perceiving or even just um, allowing you to articulate your own experience back to you in a way that you didn't know before. And sometimes books... Um, Sometimes books seem purposefully timed, and I, I, I don't know a great deal about Namwali Ser... How do you say her name properly? Serpal. I don't know a huge amount, except that I know that she's been writing for a while, and I think she's, a, she's teaching. And, um, but, you know, she has a lesson. <laughs> she, is, she is offering a lesson, and, you know, you think you know about... Oh, what 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 you know? What it was to be colonized, right? We talk about that, and we we sort of. Well, I don't, I, I don't think I understood it this way. And yeah, I think this book is is timely. The way I felt your book was timely, and it's you can't pin you can't pinpoint it and say specifically why, but but there is something fortuitous about this book coming out now. And, and the fact that she's telling this story, um, I think it's important and, and necessary. I can't wait to read it. It's exciting. Yeah. Give yourself time. Give yourself time. Um, I don't know. It's 700, 600, 642 pages. Or, I don't know. Yeah. Every page a delight. <laughs> it's just. Two of the books on here are nonfiction titles, The Furious yes. Hours and Say Nothing. Um, I'm only a few chapters into Say Nothing. It's oh fascinating. Oh, my God, it's, it's so, so good. good. Has anyone here read Say Nothing yet? Yeah. Oh, I'm jealous of all of yeah. you. I'm yeah. so jealous of you. Okay. So I won't say a great deal. I won't say nothing. <laughs> but... <laughs> um, so I had been hearing about Say Nothing, and I have a local bookstore, Three Lives Bookstore. Anybody? Um, I love it there. Oh, it's okay. heaven. It's heavenly. And um, I monitor myself. You know, I, I'm like, do you really deserve, do you, you know, do you really deserve to go to Three Lives today or not? Um, but I like to check in with them and see what, they're feeling and thinking, and they're all great readers. And um, I've been hearing about Say Nothing, and I, um, it's, once again, it's, I thought I understood yeah. troubles in Ireland. I thought I understood that conflict. I really, you know, we spend a lot of time in Ireland, my husband and I, and my family, and our children, and he, and he has for decades and decades, and we, we're, 
we're far north, but we're farther north than Northern Ireland, actually. But, um, but once again, you know, when a great writer is willing to do the work and take you in, and um, and you're willing as the reader um, to learn, you know, you can be swept away, and and it, and and a book, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, can be filled with suspense and, you know, romance and horror and you know, everything, but also when it's about a time and a place that is um, based primarily on facts, documented facts versus <laughs> alternative facts. Um, <laughs> it's a really, it's a great achievement what he's done and it, he, it's taken him years and um, it's very illuminating. And it's it's as it's like a beach thriller the way right. it's written. I mean, you're just like ripping through the pages. Yeah, I remember I've just begun it, and I was so impressed by the way that he was able to teach me so much about a conflict that I knew very little about, but in this very elegantly done way, where we're learning about these personal lives, and all of a sudden, yeah, um, it's it's terror. It's, it's so troubling. Yeah. It's really stunning, and it really I think it's the most vivid portrait I've ever seen of. Belfast, and mm -hmm. even the way the streets divide, mm -hmm. you know, the description of homes inside, behind doors, in government housing, or mm -hmm. well, I can't remember what they call it, state, a state, I can't remember what they call it. Um, mm -hmm. But you just don't, unless there's a documentary, you're just not in there that deep. Right. You know, he does it so beautifully, you're right. And I love, too, how you described it as... I think this is how you described it, what you were talking about, like this is an author who was like touched by this obsession and that obsession allowed them to then write this thing. I often feel that yeah. when I'm reading some books, like, oh, this person was like uniquely, their mind, it was working in a way that allowed them to research all this and yeah. bring it together for us. And I've, and I've since heard him, I, I, I put off, he, there's lots of interviews with, with the author, Patrick, I think it's Patrick Keefe, I can't remember his name, Patrick Radden Keefe. Keith. Um, but there's lots of interviews that are really interesting, and there's some longer format interviews. And I didn't want to listen to them until I had read the book, because I was like, oh. Um, but the more you learn about the way the way he chose to write this story and how he kept uncovering information. He's a great j journalist. I think he's a writer for The New Yorker, actually. Um, but yeah, he, he was as embedded as you could possibly be. And and um, and in doing so, you know, solved, in essence, solved, solved the mystery of a of a murder that really nobody was willing to 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 do, you know, for lots of various political reasons and complicated reasons and scary reasons. It's a great book, really good. And Dawn is the third title of SJP for mm -hmm. Hogarth. And I was really struck by the way the author, well, the author's um, biography is also so fascinating. He wrote these stories from prison. And um, in his preface, he talks about the power of literature. And I just wanted to share really quickly like what he says. It's incredible. He says, some may think it naive to turn our attention to the role of literature in the midst of such troubles. I would beg to differ. Literature, the art form that arguably comprises the backbone of any culture, not only remains at the vanguard of critical thinking, but also serves a, as a catalyst for the thoughts and feelings that in turn create political change. Let us not forget, as long as we continue to breathe life into words, those words will not abandon us. And I was wondering, you know, as a reader or as a um, editorial director, what do you believe is the power of fiction? Or this is the power of literature in your own words. Um, well, I think it's, it's sometimes I think, oh, th this is why people who aren't readers are scared of authors. This is why people burn books, because words are powerful, and authors and writers and ed educators and academics are willing to tell the truth in story, whether it's in fiction or nonfiction. And I think the power is, is the truth. And that can be in fiction. And I think it's very scary for a lot of people. I think it's why dictators and, you know, 
leaders. Um, you know, I think it's why Salahuddin uh, Dermatash is in prison because I he's scary. He's the I don't know. Do you any of you are you familiar with him? Um, so Salahuddin Dermatash, who I, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly. He's um, he is the um, he is the he was he is currently in prison since 2000, 2016 in Turkey. He's the Kurdish opposition. He's the leader of the Kurdish opposition party, and so he's run for president um, and um, he's been put in jail. He's a political prisoner. Um, he published this book, I think, almost a year and a half, two two years ago. He wrote these stories while in prison. And I think they sold two hundred thousand copies, maybe in two weeks in Turkey. Um, he's very controversial. Um, you know, if you ask Erdogan <laughs> his opinion, um, you know, he'll tell you that um, Mr. Damatash is a terrorist. Um, so you, you can go home and <laughs> you'll read all sorts of information. Um, but this book is exquisite, and it too I feel is necessary. It's a it's a story of um, being marginalized, and it's a story of um, being a refugee. It's a story of being a woman. It's, it's stories of I should say. It's it's a collection of sto short stories. It's a, a, um, it's a story of, um, you know, it's it's the story of what's happening in Turkey right now and and all over the world and and even as, you know, after we've published, we've seen lots of governments attempts to quiet people that scare them, that disagree, that oppose, that ask questions, that want to talk and share their own personal story and their own struggles and. Um, they're oftenly, often the people that are most um, different and threatening and unfamiliar. Um, and this book is funny and touching. I don't know how he finds humor, but he does. And it's not, it's not silly humor. It's smart and clever. It's knowing. It's deeply subversive. It's painful. It's a, it's a tribute to women and their strength and their courage and their um, indefatigable spirit and what they require of themselves. It's, um, it's, it's, it's really a beautiful, fun, I know it sounds weird to say fun, but he's such a good writer. He's such a fun, nimble writer. He enjoys writing so much that you, even as you experience the sort of suffering he describes, you're so happy to be with him in these stories. Yeah, the, that sense of the writer enjoying themselves is so palpable. It's almost like they're like winking while they're writing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Even as he's imprisoned. Right, right. Um, I have one kind of maybe a hard question. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I'm just wondering, you know, um, how do you? Are there any lines or details or um, moments from books that you know, as you're going about your day? will return to you and, and help you explain like what you're feeling maybe in a moment or you were talking earlier about the detail of the pennies or like the girl who mm -hmm. puts her leg up and I just wondered if you there are like certain phrases or something that like have expanded your way of perceiving the world in a way that surprises you. I'm very bad at remembering specifics I think my husband and his best friend they I don't know they remember everything from movies and books, and they can recite lines from every Mel Brooks movie and and Philip Roth and and I I'm like I can't I feel like I'm terrible about that, but I do remember things you know. Um, I remember, you know, I always think of Theo Decker. Did you guys read The Goldfinch? I was always worried about him yeah. until I met. Um, Amar. Um, until I met Amar, <laughs> and then Amar um, took <laughs> took Theo Decker's place in my heart. Um, but I would, I before I met Amar, I used to um, see Theo Decker um, meet what's his name, Ho, uh, Hobart. What's his name? Um, the man, the furniture. I've just forgotten. Sorry, I'm s the man who takes him in, and he's um, and he has a daughter. 
Pippi and or the niece or whatever. Ho I want to say his name is Hobart, but it's not Hobart. But but anyway, um, I used to see that all the time because um, Donna Tartt describes Tenth Street. She makes up Tenth Street that doesn't exist, and I tried to get from her. Where are you talking about? Like where on Tenth Street are you? Um, but she's made it up, you know, because it's it's otherworldly that book, you know. So I used to see him a lot, and then I would say, oh my god, there's, um, what's his name? The guy whose name I can't remember now, <laughs> not Theo Decker. Um, so I remember moments like that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, for some reason, in that book a lot, I, and I don't know why it flashed on it, but the, she describes when, when Theo and Boris are in Vegas, and, and Boris has worn his father's coat, and it's a, this old, wet military coat, you know, from like the Russian military or something and she describes it hanging up in a bathtub soaking wet and what you know what wool smells like and it's so bleak and depressing anyway Vegas how she describes it properly and um you know that sort of housing development and so I remember things like that you know I remember so much about Hadia's wedding or visuals and smells but I don't remember and I think I remember them because I want to be there again I want to be back in that book for the first time. Yeah, that feeling, um, or a book that ignites that kind of feeling, I, I one of the worst feelings in my life is when I'm reaching the end of a book that I've loved. Terrible. And it feels like, what if I never feel this way as I'm right. reaching it, which is not true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you just don't wanna say goodbye. You don't yeah. wanna leave that world. You want things to be undecided. And it's um, a real conflict because you both want to know what's yes. on the remaining pages, right. but you're desperate for it to right. not be over. Right. I'm doing this crazy thing right now. So I just started Elena Ferrante's um, oh, wow. Neapolitan novels. And I read the first one in January and I became obsessed with it. And I didn't allow my to myself to read the second one until March. <laughs> and now I know there's only two left. And I'm like, when am I going to like give in? Because I see them and I want to read them, but I want to space it out. I just yeah, exactly. don't want to be done. You've got to parcel yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very hard, though. Yeah. you got to find great books in between that mm -hmm. distract you from right. them calling your name. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Exactly. I've got um, some recommendations if you need some. Yeah, yeah no, I'm definitely going to read old, <laughs> The Old Drift after Oh, I it's leave. so good. Um, so I have a few quick... I don't know how we're doing on time. How are we doing on time? Okay, good. Oh, okay. So I have a few quick, fun, easy oh, questions. Sure. Okay. And then we can take questions from the audience. Okay, Dogie. Uh, these are really quick ones. What's the best book you were ever gifted? Uh, y yours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I'm you. kidding. Uh, what's the book that you most often find yourself gifting another? Well, yours for a long time <laughs> to be. Uh, that's the that's the truth. But lately, I will tell you. Yeah. Lately, since yeah. and pass, passed on, which was gifted, but. Um, there were a lot of men in my life who aren't great, like they're not devoted readers. So I gave a lot of them say nothing because I was like, this will, yeah, this will reading. seduce them. This will be yes. the lure. This will be the, yeah. the gateway drug or whatever. Uh -huh. And so then I gave it to yeah. so many people and then I went back to Three Lives and I was like, I'm embarrassed to tell you that now I'm buying a copy for myself. I bought one for my husband, but I felt like that was his. Right. And if I took it, Right. Then you'd be like, oh, you didn't really mean this for me. You meant it right, for you. Right. <laughs> so that's the one most recently. Yeah. I love how clear it is that you're such a champion for books, like no matter what, even if it's like, you don't read, but I know what's going to get you. To and you know what? I gave it to this guy and his husband was like, he doesn't read. He doesn't read. I was like, just, yeah. he'll read. I love it. It's been, you know, I was like, you're a reader. Yeah. Well, I began that and I was just like immediately pulled and, in. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, what, this is a kind of funny one. This is for me, maybe. Uh, what is one of your fiction character crushes? Like, if they were a real person in real life, you'd totally be in love with them. Um, oh, my God. I have so many. Um, oh, now I can't think of any. Hold on a second. Let's come back to that. Okay. Just give me, we'll, and we'll take other questions, and then I'll come okay. back. Okay. Uh, what is a name, in an, a, no, a name that you encountered in a novel that you loved? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Maybe well, I love hard. Theo Decker for some reason, just because it's like, I don't know, Theodore Decker. It's, yeah, it's Theo, too easy. They sound good together, they Theo They sound really Decker. good together. Mm -hmm. uh, gosh. Um, I'm bad at these. <laughs> no. My last one. If okay. you were a character in a novel, as you are, but your life was fictionalized, where would the story of your life begin? 
Wait, say that again. What? <laughs> so, <laughs> if you were a character in a novel, like you were, your life was fictionalized. Where, like, what scene would the story of your life begin? Okay, wait. I'm not <laughs> smart enough. Wait, I'm not sure I'm smart enough. Wait, make it even, even make it even dumber. Um, <laughs> no. So, if because I want to answer you it, you were a character in a novel. What would not be? me. Actually, it was like a novel about you. Oh, like, where okay. would it? Where would that scene begin? Like for me, maybe I would say something like, uh, "It would begin when I'm, you know, um, me and my brothers have just watched Lion King for the first time, <laughs> and we're like obsessed with that scene where Scar kills Mufasa." Right, horrible. Yeah, horrible, traumatizing, right. and yet so traumatizing. Yeah. And me and my brother, we came home and we just could not get it out of our mind. We kept throwing each other off the couch. <laughs> saying, like, long live the king and, like, throwing each other off. And I do think that maybe that's where the story of my life would begin. I think that's great because it also would yeah. be inexplicable. Like, what, what's happening and why? Yeah, yeah. Um, why would a brother do that? You well, know? that's very good. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, I guess maybe uh, I guess maybe I might um, have coming to New York, mm. you know, as a young girl, yeah. you know, really having time here and then like I'd collapse time a little bit because then I'd go back to Cincinnati Amazing. and I would be like the way I would think about it because you yeah. can make it very cinematic like hmm, well, someday, I'm going to get back there you know like you just answered that so incredibly you just structured the first few <laughs> chapters of your novel <laughs> that's amazing thank you so much um, does anyone from the audience have any questions Yes. Thank you. Good evening, and I enjoyed the discussion very much. My question to you, Ms. Parker, would be when you're reading books, um, as an actress, do you think in terms of adaptation, like, oh, if I was to adapt this for t like a limited TV series or for film, like, do you approach books in that manner? Not at all. That's why I have no, I'm not successful very much that way. Because, I mean, I know, like, I'm not, like, I don't, other people do that really, really well, and um, who are who are great book lovers equally, you know. But I, I think my relationship with books is, I think I'm self like I forget. You could be mercenary, you know. You could think of it strategically, and I just, I haven't done it yet. I really haven't. I, I mean, I, and and any book that I'm describing here, they're all enormously cinematic immediately you can you can imagine a life on a smaller large screen all of these books but I didn't <laughs> I just love reading but that doesn't mean that I'm not getting it together I'm like wait a minute so maybe I'll be more clever in the future um I how, do I you choose guys, you, you don't make oh. us choose right okay. do we have to yes. choose yeah yeah so scary. Hi. Bye. I'm surprised I haven't seen you in the neighborhood yet, but now I'm going to look. No. Okay, hi. Um, so I'm just curious. I am kind of sad sometimes when a book is made into a movie because I have my feeling that, like, all of a sudden, like, my... Kind it can't of live up to your changes. movie. So I'm wondering, right, how exactly how you guys feel when a book is made into a movie. Like, thumbs down, whatever, thumbs up. I feel like you've probably seen more adaptations of mo books to movies than I have. I'm very bad about seeing movies, so I apologize. The way that I think about it is that you just have to separate it. It's a different form, so you cannot ex expect the movie to do for you what the book did. And if it's if it's been adapted well, it'll just take on it'll be the similar story but in a completely different form, like organized in a different way. Yeah. I, I don't have enough experience, but I tend to not. I tend to be pretty loyal to the book. Like I'm like I'm, I can't see that because I read that. I love the. I love the book. I, you know, but my daughters, I will say, are not allowed to see the movie. So they've read the book because you can always. Their books tend to be so much more concentrated, and yeah. movies have to cherry pick. You know, because you don't get to spend eight hours in a movie theater typically. You no, know, so they have to like carve away some of the stuff that I'm like most attached to, or I'm afraid they have. Yes. 
Um, so my grandmother has always said that you have an upstairs book and a downstairs book, and you read, read them at the same time. And your upstairs is oh like gosh, your rom-com, your did? beach read, and then your downstairs is your nonfiction or your heavy Wait, read. Sh- the upstairs is the what? The rom-com, the like beach oh. read that you don't really want people seeing. But then your downstairs, <laughs> your downstairs book is your like nonfiction, your heavy read that you want to show like, oh, I'm reading this right now. <laughs> so do you read multiple books at once, or are you all in in one book? You want to go first? Sure. Um, I do read multiple books at the same time. I, I I think I'm a bad reader in that I don't, if if I sense that a book is like an upstairs read, I guess what I'm saying is like if I, if I, I since I've started reading as a writer, I'm, I'm try, I like approach books for three reasons, you know, one is like the story and what is the author doing? And the other is like, can I learn something from this? And if it's not fulfilling both of those and, and the, then I, I just don't stay committed to it, I guess. Um, but I do read multiple things at the same time. So. I don't, except if it's for for work. Like, I, I'll have to be reading a bunch of stuff for work, but I don't consider that really voluntary. Like, I don't think that that's my choice. And um, it's my choice. I'm happy to do it. It's not a burden, but it's different than the book I like. And I, um, I don't... This will, like, be the thing I'm most... I, like, I, I don't read any book I'm embarrassed of. I, I, I never got into that genre of book. Like, I, I don't know if it was my mom. Maybe she didn't let us read something the other kids were reading. That would be too enjoyable for us. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, she was very snobby about that. And, you know, that's junk. Like, she, we were not allowed to have a Barbie doll, for instance. Like, that we just weren't. And so she didn't ever let us read the, the stuff that, and I've got no issue with reading it. She just conditioned me, mm-hmm. so I don't read it. Mm-hmm. But I bet it's fun, and I prob- mm-hmm. I would probably have if I t- yeah I I would probably have an upstairs. When we were younger, we covered our books with a grocery bag, mm-hmm. you know. Like I would just do that and get, call it upstairs <laughs> and downstairs, right. like right. everywhere an everywhere book. That's amazing. Uh, yes, this you? gentleman. Hi, I have a question for each. So what's your vision for your imprint? And for you, in your case, do you have another book? Do you have your next book already in your brain? And where is that going? Let's start, start with, with Fatima. You. Okay. <laughs> um, for a long time, I did not allow myself to think of another book. Um, but recently, well, for actually... Yeah, for a while now, I've been I've been starting to think, uh, but it's going to be very different than the first one, and so I don't know how I'm going to approach it. Um, so I haven't actually sat down and begun the prose part of it, but I'm I'm thinking about it and and I'm writing thinking it. about it <laughs> all the time. I'm so excited. Um, yeah, and and I, I'm not you know I'm not sure we you know got to publish three beautiful books that I'm very privileged and you know we'll see what um you know what happens and what i might find or you know get to be part of uh, you know I'll, I'll always be looking for the next book but i do i really do like the thing that's been most interesting and most exciting is that i had have a chance have had a chance to work in um the literary fiction genre which is i think a unique space in the world of publishing and um and I think it d- deserves support and explanation. And I, I want very much to continue to talk about whether I publish them or not, to talk about literary fiction, because I think it takes you to, to other places. I think it's often you know, an instrument for cultivating empathy and understanding each other better. It's often global voices, which I'm most interested in, voices from far away, a lot of diverse voices people that are unfamiliar, places that are unfamiliar, religions that are unfamiliar, you know. So those are the things that I'm interested in as a reader and as a publisher. Uh, Yes. Thank you. Um, Which book or books for you celebrate New York the way that Sex and the City did? (gasps) Oh, my (laughs) gosh. Oh. Um, Gosh, I'm trying to think about... A New York book. Hold on. Oh, Lord. A New York... Wait a minute. There's so many great books. 
um, about this city. What's wrong with me? I want to. I so much want to answer that question because there's fantastic, important books about our city, and I. Yeah. I mean, oh my God, I'm. I'm choking. I'm falling short. I'm. I'm. A, I'm. I'm, um, I'm. That's a great question. Do other people have ideas? E. B. White. Right, this is New York, of course. And of I, course. I haven't read it yet, but Patty Smith's just. Oh, I hits. hear that is amazing, amazing. Forgive me, I hear that's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God! Interesting. Bonfire of the Vanities. I don't know. That's a different idea. It's a little cynical. Yeah. I think the go go eighties. Pardon? New York the novel. Is that a book? There's a book called New York the novel. All right, mm -hmm. fantastic. I hope someone's taking notes. Yeah. I think there's time for two more questions. Um, young lady right there. Hello, lovely to be here. Uh, a question for each of you, please. Uh, as editorial director, what in a manuscript uh, makes you jump and say, hey, this is something I want to publish? That's for you, Sarah. And for Fatima, um, you have an India Connect. Uh, do any of your books already talk about India, or do you at some point plan to weave that in into your story? Thank you. Can I go first? Sure. Um, the novel, A Place for Us, is, is I don't think of it as a no novel about um, a family immigrating from India. It's not about the immigration experience to me. It's about, you know, what happens when their kids are here and, and growing up. And so the, the there's only one scene that um, takes place in Hyderabad, which is where my family is from in India. Um, but I do think that it's a place that I'm going to be returning to in my imagination and in my fiction and trying to understand... Um, um, yeah, trying to understand it better and trying to understand uh, what each generation inherits in a way from a place. Oh yeah, I've been to I've been to Hyderabad um, only twice in my life. I'm dying to go back, and I've been to Mumbai and Delhi. Yeah. Um, and I'll just say that um, I think probably the same experience you have when you're opening and reading for the first few pages and you're struck and you want to be nowhere else. I mean, in the case of Fatima's book, it was just taken in immediate light, immediately by where we were in that story and just touching on what she gives us just just enough to hook up, to, to make, to, I just didn't want to be anywhere else. I mean, and I couldn't imagine, and then of course you're, you're deeper, and the next thing you know, you're deeper and deeper, and you're hundreds of pages in. And I couldn't imagine that we would ever have the opportunity to publish a book of that skill and that um, that kind of colorful, vivid storytelling. Um, and and the same with um, Claire Adams' book, you know, Taken to the World, which I, I, I would love to just mention, um, Golden Boy, Golden Child, sorry, no, wait, no, Golden Boy. Golden Child. Golden Boy is a Charles Strauss musical. <laughs> Golden, um, but it's the Claire Adam book, and it's a book about a family in Trinidad and Tobago, and it's a it's a it's a heartbreaking. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. It's a heartbreaking story about sacrifice and um, and dignity and class system and money and the economy of Trinidad and Tobago at this time. And once again, you learn so much, but you are completely absorbed because of the characters, and we knew that, we knew it immediately when we read you know, the first 10, 20 pages, that here was this man desperate to do right by his family and by these boys. And so I think what hits you is the, the place where you find yourself and the people who keep you in that place and just skillful writing. Thank you. Do we have time? For one more, yes. Thanks. Um, I have a question for Fatima, but also it could be extended to Sarah Jessica. Um, I'm wondering, was there a character for you that was most difficult to write in this book that just you you couldn't get there 
their voice or their character right, and it took a little while to find that cadence. And I guess in turn, uh, Sarah Jessica, it was their character that was most fun for you to read or most exciting or most interesting for you to read in this book. Mm. Um, um, for me, actually, I think the mother, Layla, was the hardest to write um, because it was a, you know, Layla and Rafiq, the, both of the parents are, are the least like me in terms of age and where they're from and what role, what place they are at in their lives. But Rafiq was a little bit easier to imagine my way into. But Layla's, um, you know, if I met Layla in real life, we might disagree about some things. We might disagree about what she thinks the role of um, her daughters is or like how she approaches her sons. But I, and so for me, it was, it was like my up uh, my ultimate goal was like to try and understand and honor her experience and and not approach her as Fatma who would you know if Layla was my mom she's not but if she was would be arguing with her but instead like trying to understand what makes Layla think like this how can I understand her and, and write her without any kind of judgment um, so that was the hardest it took a lot of of drafts yeah I think it's so interesting I don't, I don't I'm gonna kind of stay with her question for a second just to talk about that more for a second. I think when you read a place for us, for those of you who haven't yet um, raced to your local library and get on the wait list, because there's always a wait list for that book. Um, but I think the last section, some people call it the last section, basically is a story of Rafiq. And I think it's the father. And it's, it's stunning to experience and has been um, talked about so much by readers and reviewers, because it's, it's, um, it's such a massive accomplishment to be inside the father, be inside the head of this man who is so unfamiliar, right? But written by a woman who was at the time, what, 21, 22, 23, like 20, you know, 18, 19. I mean, it's crazy. And, and that section of the book is so heartrending. It's so deeply moving. You understand so much more about the way he chose to parent and all of his shortcomings and why he was withholding and when he was and what it meant to him to be a father in America, to raise American children, to be an American family, even as they are Muslim American, you know? And I think that that is, um, it's not so much that I related, but I was so, all of us in those early days of reading the manuscript were so swept away by Fatima's ability to understand a man who is, so different even than her own father. Like he's not, Rafiq is not Fatima's father. It's a huge, um, it's just such a triumph. Um, and I love being with him. It was painful and painful for most people who read the book that can't stop weeping. Thank you. And yeah, you were speaking earlier about what it was like to publish. And I just want to say again, like it was that you read it, that you, that I was able to embark on this journey with you was it was like the greatest gift for to me and I'm so grateful and I am I continue to be like so inspired by the way that you think about literature and the way that you talk about it and I'm sure everybody tonight is you know feeling that too and also really excited to to go home and, and <laughs> always nice to be um I just quickly say um, thank you so much, Fatima. You did beautifully, and it's always nice to be in a in a room with readers. It's so cool, and I hope next time if I'm invited back, we can turn the tables on you, <laughs> and you can talk, and we can listen. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Another round of applause, please, for Fatima and for Sarah Jessica. Um, I've met a lot of publishing people and booksellers and librarians, and I don't think there's a bigger book champion than you. It is amazing. Thank you so much. That's so great. So um, we are going to let our special guests um, walk around uh, the room there and kind of make their way. Um, the rest of us, I just want to let you know about um, an event that's happening on Monday. Uh, there's the third and final event in this series for this year. Um, I know there's at least one person in the room who has a 100% attendance record at this series over two years. So I want to see, oh, there's two, I know right here. All right. So I'd like to see the rest of you up in the Bronx 
On Monday, Sonia Manzano, better known as Maria from Sesame Street, is going to tell us about how much she loves books, um, and that's going to be extraordinary. So please join us. Um, meanwhile, um, we can all proceed up to the first floor, and there's a little reception thing going on. So make sure you got your book. Make sure you get some cheese and some cookies. And thank you for coming.